Hi, I'm uh, Robert Fabry, author of the Vespasian series. So, Vespasian is the main character in the series, obviously. Um, he uh, came from a rural background. Um, his father was a centurion, got invalided out of the army, achieved uh, a question rank. So he's right in the you know sort of middle of uh, Roman society. Um, he has a right to go to Rome. He has a right to try and better himself. Um, so that's what he does. We have to take him from um, being a country boy, country bumpkin, uh, up to the point where he becomes emperor, the most powerful man in the Western world. Um, so what we cannot do uh, when writing about somebody like that is impose our Western Christianized uh, morals on him. His morality is completely different to our morality. So what we get is a character who um, is not um, in modern sense uh, would not be considered that nice. Um, there are things about him which obviously uh, we do like but uh, it gets to the point uh, in the book that I'm just about to finish now, uh, Masters of Rome, the fifth one, where I'm giving him attributes which um, are very much those of an anti-hero. We, um, we cannot keep on liking him and thinking, oh, isn't he wonderful? No, he, to have become, been the last man standing in 69 AD, he must have been a pretty tough customer. Um, he has a sidekick. Magnus, uh, I was ridiculed when some circus, circumstance, uh, circles for uh, uh, giving him a sidekick. God, that's terrible. Well, I like having Magnus uh, because Magnus gives us the opportunity to go where Vespasian cannot go because of his rank. Magnus uh, comes from uh, the underbelly of Rome, as Patronus of the South Quirinal Crossroads Brotherhood. We can do things with Magnus that we could not do with Vespasian. We can see a different side of Rome, uh, which I explore in um, in the short stories. Um, Magnus is Rome, um, the Crossroads Brotherhood, and uh, the racing factions so far I've written. Uh, and I have great fun um, having Magnus around. He, um, he is canny, uh, and he's someone for Vespasian to bounce off of. Then we have Antonia. She drives the first three books. Very powerful woman. Assuring that her interests are looked after. She, her motivation is to keep her family uh, at the very top of Roman society. Uh, she is completely focused on uh, the success of the Julia Claudian family, even though they're pretty unsuitable to rule. It doesn't bother her. Um, she will um, she will keep them in power at any price. Vespasian gets caught up with her and learns much from her about the ruthlessness of um, Roman life. Then we have um, Vespasian's uncle, Gaius Vespasius Pollo. Um, there's no written evidence uh, that he ever had children. So I've used that as an excuse to explore uh, perceived sexual ex excesses in Rome. I actually based him on Uncle Monty from Whitnail and I, dear boy. And um, yes, so uh, it's, it's, it's a fun thing to um, have Uncle Gaius and his um, house full of beautiful German slave boys with a Tunics slightly too short. Um, couldn't resist it, sorry. Uh, then we get um, Sabinus, Vespasian's brother. Uh, and I started giving him, sort of um, made him jealous and, um, of Vespasian, uh, and there's an antipathy between them right from the beginning. Although it's not so much shared by Vespasian, but Sabinus hates, hates Vespasian. Uh, and that thaws during the course of the series. 
uh, because I thought it would be interesting to, ta to take it from that point to the point which the historical uh, point in 69 AD where uh, Sabinus is executed by Vitellius um, for supporting Vespasian. So Sabinus eventually not sacrifices his life for his brother but gives his life certainly for his brother's cause. Um, so I, I enjoy, um, I enjoy the, um, the journey that we go on. Um, and there is also historical evidence for that. Uh, at one point, uh, Vespasian comes back from Africa. Um, he's bankrupt, and, Vis and Sabinus gives him a loan, but not an unsecured loan. Vespasian has to mortgage his estates to Sabinus. So, um, you know, that's not necessarily the action of um, of a loving brother. Um, so I, I, I feel justified in in having that antipathy between them. And then we have kindness. Kynus, who was Antonia's secretary, uh, and she's renowned actually for perhaps having a photograph photographic memory. She's a highly intelligent woman, and the love of Vespasian's life. When they met, we don't know. Um, I've chosen to have them meet right at the you know, in the first book um, because I wanted to have a relationship there for as long as possible. Uh, so they meet when Vespasian's 16 and Kynus is 18. Um, she was almost certainly freed in Antonia's will. Um, there was um, a law saying that you could not free uh, a slave before the age of thirty. And when Antonia died, Kynes would have becoming that age uh, would have been that age. So she was, that's when she was probably freed. As a freed woman, Vespasian could not marry her. The senator could not marry a freed woman. Um, it was um, it was the law, and that was that. It was a, a fact. So, Vespasian has to marry um, elsewhere in order to um, be able to have legitimate children. Uh, so he marries uh, Flavia Domitilla. Uh, but what happened to Kynes during that wedding, uh, during during their marriage, we don't know. Maybe she faded into the background. Maybe she stayed with Vespasian in a complicated menage a trois. We don't know, but what we do know is that when Flavia Domitilla dies, Kynes then returns to Vespasian full time, and although she can't marry him, she became his wife in all but name. Um, and actually used to, to, to uh, when he became emperor, used to charge fortunes for access to him. So she wasn't squeaky clean either in, uh, uh, in modern day terms, but that was good business practice uh, in Roman times. Um, they must have loved each other for that relationship to have lasted and I enjoy watching them develop um, as the situation um, gets more and more difficult for them with this patient having to marry in order to have children which is what he of course he wants, he needs a son and heir.